in the middle of Revelation 12. And I take it verse for verse. So it takes us a while to get there. Let me explain where we are in the, in the briefest sense that Revelation 12 is a major turning point in the book of Revelation. Not that certain parts of the first part were not important, but this is a beginning of transition in the sequential events that take place in the second half of the Great Tribulation. And when we get to the second half of the Great Tribulations, which we'll study in 12, 13, and part of 14, it gets to be pretty nasty down here on the earth. And so we should be grateful that as the church, we probably will not be here. There will be people being saved during the tribulation, both Jews and Gentiles. But hopefully the church, the bride of Christ, will be out of the way and uh, out of all the issues. But there will still be people who have to live and die by faith. So we'll start at Revelation chapter 12 today, verse 7. So if you'll turn your Bibles there. And I like you to, I know you can read the, the words up here. But I really love it when you're in your own Bibles, making notes, and that kind of a thing. If you were to open up my study Bible, you'd see there's writing all over it. It's not blasphemy. That's just simply helping me know what I want to talk about. So with that, today, Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 through 12. We're going to read two verses this time and then go on from there. Starting at verse 7, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So last week we talked about three important people. The woman who was Israel, who gave birth to the child who is Jesus, and then the Satan, the red dragon who is Satan. Now we've got a little bit of an introduction here to Michael. I just want to go briefly with that. We're starting on the sermon time late. It's only 20 of 12, so I'll try to get you out here by 10 after, maybe 5 after, for I preach really, really fast. So Michael is an angel who's one of the archangels, along with Gabriel, and he was one who was always seen in battle. Whenever Israel was in battle, it seems if there was an angel present, it was Michael. That's all I need to say about him. So what we're going to do from here is talk about the final war in heaven for a few moments and what that means to us. And it says in this passage that we just read that Satan was then cast out. Now why do I say then cast out? Because there are two views that are predominant in the church and among theologians today. View one is that in the before creation, Satan did rebel against God. We know that. That we all agree upon. But some think that at that point he was cast to the earth and had no more uh, interaction with God. However, we see that he did have interaction with Job. He had uh, interaction in the book of Zechariah when he uh, refuted uh, the uh, priest Joshua and accused him before the father. We can go all the way into Corinthians where there's a messenger of Satan given to, to uh, the Apostle Paul. So something is going on there that is different perhaps than we view. So some people believe that at the fall of Satan he was cast out of heaven and then cast into the earth and this is his total domain. And there is some truth to that. Then also there's the second view which is that when Satan fell he was cast out of the third heaven. You can read, and I'm going very fast this morning, you can read in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 Paul is talking about he knew a man who had gone up into the third heaven. Now, we all suspect that that man was Paul. He just didn't want to say it. But whoever it was had gone to the third heaven. The third heaven is later identified as paradise, which we would call today heaven. Whoever this was, however it occurred, in the body, out of the body, Paul says he doesn't know. But this individual had gone to be before God in heaven, basically before the throne. That's the third heaven, and that's what I believe, my own view is, is that when Satan fell, he was thrown out of that area, but then was given the area down here in what we call the atmosphere of the earth and space outward. So there's the three heavens, atmosphere of earth, this outer space, and paradise with God in heaven. So that's where Satan basically, I believe, has been functioning for a very long time. And when this war breaks out in heaven, which I believe is future, might even be starting now, I don't know. We don't know how long the war will be. But there's a spiritual battle among the angels of God and Satan and his evil angels. It's going on maybe now, I don't know. But when it ends, he will be cast out, even of those realms, and he will be released fully 
upon the earth. And that's where part of the horror of the Great Tribulation, I believe, begins to have its impact. Now, what we need to understand is we can disagree on that. And it doesn't change your theology. It won't change anything about your belief about Jesus Christ. It just gives you a context. So I want you to understand that, that Satan's realm is, you can find this. I'm going to go quick through this. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 2, it talks about he's the prince of the power of the air. And then you go to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, and it talks about how he has dominion, the principalities and powers, and that he has this power on the earth. Here he works a lot. And he, he creates issues and difficulties for the saints of God today. And that's what he's about. He's called the great accuser of the brethren. And he will one day be thrown out. Now, what matters here, in my opinion, is that either of you will work. So I'm just going to give you that. That's the way I am. I'm honest with you. I hold the second view. You can hold the first view. But the reality is we need to understand that the battle is on. It's been on since the beginning of time from the moment that Satan decided to rebel against God. There has always been a war on. Amen? Turn to somebody and say, the battle is on. Say that back to the other person, the battle is on. Now the question is, are you involved in the battle? You remember last week I talked to us a little bit about being in the battle. And I talked to us from the area of Judges chapter 3, and I believe it to be verse 1, where God has left some of the enemy in the, the land of Israel in order that the Israelites, the new generations, could learn war. There's a reality about that with all of us. And I think certain portions of the church of the living God today, called the church of Jesus Christ, I believe many of those know how to do battle. I think many do not. I think some are AWOL, absent without leave. I think some are on the battlefield but not armed and don't know what to do and just hope that they don't get slaughtered as this lion is seeking whom he may devour. What I'm saying to us here is, first and foremost, you are in the battle. You enlisted when you received Jesus Christ as Savior. I made a little joke last week about maybe some of you are here because you got drafted. You know, your wife made you come or your parents made you come or whatever. There really is no draft in the kingdom of God. It's all enlistment. And once you enlist, you have enlisted under the greatest power and kingdom and authority that will ever be and has always been. Amen. We talked about last week that if you want to be a part of something that's really big, you know, they're always telling people, if you, you really want to be successful, be a part of something bigger than yourself. I do not know anything bigger than the kingdom of God. That's the one thing that is going to last forever and forever and forever. Turn to somebody and say forever. forever. The kingdom of God is the biggest thing you'll ever join. And what's so strange is you don't have to have any experience. You don't have to have any great amount of knowledge. You don't have to be highly educated. You don't have to be a doctor or a lawyer or a professor or a pastor or an evangelist. You just simply enlist. That's one of the beautiful things. You can just enlist. That means that you've heard the call of the commander in chief. And you've said, I respond. I receive Christ as my Savior. I know that you called to me. I didn't find you, but now I've heard the call. I go forward in that. And so the question that we have in this first section of these two verses is where are you in the kingdom of God? Are you doing your part? And there are many parts. There are those who never see the battlefield per se, but they're in the aspect of logistics and provision, getting things where they need to be. That might be, say, money to the missionary or whatever it may be, or supporting the pastor or helping the church or whatever it may be. Some of us may be right out on the, on the front lines. It, I don't know. God has a different position for everyone. But each of us is in the kingdom if we have believed and we are responsible to our commander. And our commander is Jesus Christ. Paul, we, we dare not say no to him. He doesn't ask, he tells. He gives orders, he gives commands. Do this, don't do that. And that's who we are. So in the book of Revelation, whether we understand it sequentially, whether we can comprehend every one of its symbols, it's not as important as two things. The book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And the second portion in application is our response to that. How have you responded to Jesus? Is it simply that I've come to Jesus Christ, that I've enlisted in the army, but I'm going to stay home? I'm not going to go out and put on the armor. I'm not going to go out and be a part of the battle. Revelation brings us down to that. 
when we see the end times coming, we may be in them. They may already be started. We don't know. But we know this much. When the tribulation begins, red line in the sand will be drawn. It will be drawn, and it will be red, and it will be the blood of Jesus Christ. And you're going to be either here, or you're going to be there, and there's going to be no in-between. And we need to live that way today, saints. That's how we need to be living today. So the battle's on. The question is, where are you? Are you absent without leave? Are you finding your way into the, to the work of the kingdom of God? The first place is, where do you go when you join the military? The first thing you do to get off the bus, they strip you of practically everything you own. Amen. You can't even call home. And then, boom, boot camp. Boot camp. Church is boot camp. This is where you learn to use the weapons that you have been given. Boot camp. This is where you learn to take up the sword, take up the shield, take up the helmet, put on the armor of light, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. This is where you begin to serve. This is where you begin to learn all the things and the intricacies of the Bible so that you can go out into the world and you can be a representation to be a real warrior for Jesus Christ. So Revelation's got a lot in it that you've probably never seen before. And if you look at it sequentially and you think, well, the church will be gone then, fine. But until then, we are still part of the battle. We are obligated to face this world with Jesus Christ. We are obligated to strive to reach the next generation below us and pass on to them the torch of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's who we are. Amen. Boy, I thought I heard some snoring out there. I'm not sure. But you need to wake up, saints. There is not much time left. Even if the Lord delays for another 50 years or 1,000 years, you only have so much time. Somewhere between 60 and 100 years is the general gift of all of us. What have you got left? And how are you going to spend it? And are you going to be faithful to the God who created you, the God who called you and gave you life through His Son, Jesus Christ? That's verse 7 and 9. And I'm just getting started. Verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. This is an amazing statement here. It's an amazing reality. What's going on here, some people believe that that's talking about the final future when Jesus comes back after the battle of Armageddon and establishes his kingdom upon the earth. And I will tell you that may be true. I also will tell you there's another interpretation that we can apply to us today. Jesus said the kingdom of God is where? Where? It's within you. The kingdom of God is within you. So what's happening in this passage, in just verse 10, these two kingdoms are getting ready to come into radical conflict. They've always been in conflict. There's always been a battle. But now it's going to start raging and it's going to rage on the earth. And the view is from heaven in this passage that they're looking and saying salvation has come, the kingdom has come, power has come, authority has come, and you better be ready. And you better be part of that. And yes, you can put it into the future and say there it is, Jesus Christ with his scepter as he rules from Jerusalem. That's going to happen someday. But between now and then, the kingdom of God is within us. And what happens is, as we live out the kingdom of God in us, this power, this presence of the kingdom of God who is Christ in you, the hope of glory, comes out around you everywhere you go and influences everything you do. Everything. Even when you don't know it. Even when you're not conscious of it. You are different. Jesus said, Father, I do not pray that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the world. You see, we're supposed to be out there. We're supposed to be bringing, as it were, this, this hidden kingdom into this whole dark world. This is not an earthly kingdom as yet. It will be one day. But we're supposed to take this kingdom that resides in us and release it with the salvation message that God has saved those who will put their trust in his son, Jesus Christ. That's the first part. So we are saved by what we know of Jesus Christ and our commitment to him. The next thing is, is that we have power. What's that power for? That power is the ability of the Holy Spirit to cause us to convey the truth even when we are in a place of, of dire straits. 
Many times in our lives, Shirley and I, not so much here in America, once or twice here in my early years in the street ministries, but definitely overseas, our lives were in a place of threat. And the only thing that caused us to be able to do what we did was the kingdom of God within us. The power of God to override our fears. The power of God to override everything in us and to say, speak the gospel. I can't tell you how many times that has happened when I've had to preach overseas. I'm thankful for it and I'm not boasting in it. I'm telling you it wasn't me. It was the kingdom of God. Everything in my flesh was crying out, run. Everything in my flesh was crying out, keep your big mouth shut. And right when I would think that, God would open my mouth. He said, open my, your mouth and I'll fill it. Well, he filled it. And people came to Christ. Because I brought to them the power of the kingdom of God. The truth about salvation. The need of man for a savior. And that's what we gain as we start to study the book of Revelation. It's about Jesus, but it's also about our response to Jesus. So the message of salvation, the, the ability of the power of God, and the kingdom of God within you, bringing salt and light into a really rotting, decaying world. Are you doing that? Are you hoping and praying? Are you asking God, Lord, give me an opportunity today to share the light of the kingdom of God. Let me be a beacon of light. Let me stand before you. Let me be a, a voice for you. Give me opportunity. We should pray that every day. Every day. Turn that and say, we should pray that every day. Turn to somebody. If you don't pray anything else, could you pray that? Say, God, I don't know what else to say, but would you give me an opportunity today to share the gospel of Jesus Christ? And that's going to become very important in a moment when I talk about testimony. To share the gospel of Christ, and then you have the authority with you because of the kingdom of God within you. You have the authority, the authority of the word, the authority of the risen Christ, the authority of the blood, the authority of the miracles. You have all of that at your disposal. Are you using it? That's what God is asking us. Are you waking up each day or going to bed at night and saying, God, tomorrow, oh, tomorrow, Lord, give me one. Give me one. Give me a chance. Give me an opportunity to be the light, to be the expression of the kingdom of God in this place because the world is in a very sad state. We agree? So that's what this kingdom is doing. It's meeting a challenge. And what's going to happen in verse 10, it says that the kingdom is coming. Now it is. Well, it's also going to face Satan. Satan is going to be enraged as he is thrown even out of the realms that he's owned up there. And now he's on the earth. Everything's going to be happening here. De the death and destruction and tribulation will increase beyond your wildest imaginations. I can't think to imagine. I'm glad I can't. I don't want to know that much. But this much will happen. He will come and he will attack all those who have true faith in God. Whether it's tr true faith in the Messiah, meaning the Jews, or true faith in Jesus Christ, meaning the Gentiles that get saved. Yes, in the tribulation, people will be saved. The church will hopefully have been raptured out. But salvation will continue on till the very end. And Satan will be enraged and angered at God and his people. And he will attack with a viciousness that we have never seen before. He's going to make Hitler and Mao and those men look like kindergarten. Nobody will be able to stand except that their name is written in the Lamb's book of life. That's what's going to happen. Satan is going to come. And here's what's going to happen. I call it the four D's. The first thing he's going to do is to dissolve his relationship with Israel. He's going to dissolve the covenant of protection for Israel. In the end of that first three and a half years, he's going to go after Israel with everything he's got. Now the scripture tells us God will protect them. How that's going to happen, I don't know. Then it says he will defile that temple. Once he's dissolved the contract with him, he will come into that temple somehow. I don't know exactly what it will be. And he will defile it before the living God. And then once he's done that, he will declare himself to be God. And thus believing he is God and declaring him to be God, himself to be God, he will demand the worship of the world. And that's been Satan's goal for centuries. He wants to be worshipped just as God was worshipped. And anybody who refuses to bow the knee to him, 
to put their trust in him and worship him, they will be liable unto death, to destruction. That's what's coming. And we are a people who need to be bringing as many as we can into the knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that's point two. Point three we'll take from verse 11. Verse 11 says this, And they overcame him. They overcame. Say overcame. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives even unto death. It's a great statement. What's going on here? First of all, the word is in the past tense. They overcame. Now, if we're looking at this from heaven, we're seeing it as, well, it's ended. The other part could be that it's prophetic, that we will overcome, and that's what I believe. There's two sides to this scripture as well. There's the future when all will be there and say, hey, they overcame, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And then there's going to be the side that's looking down there that they are overcoming. I can show you that in scripture, that the saints will overcome the evil one. It will be a final vicious battle between us and him, and the battle will not be fought physically. It will be fought spiritually as the great deception is released upon the earth. As the great apostasy occurs upon the earth, there will be those who are saved in the tribulation, maybe from the 144,000 Jewish evangelists. You know, if an, if an evangelist is going to evangelize, what's going to happen? People are going to get saved. And can you imagine that? Those people, when they get saved, they're going to tell other people that they got saved and how to get saved. Amen? Amen. Do you remember when you got saved? I do, and I, I knew when I got saved, I understood very clearly what the message was. And I didn't have any friends that were Christians. All my friends were worldly. They got sick of me. <laughs> I kept telling them, hey, you've got you to meet Jesus. You've got to find out what I found out. He's, he's changed who I am. He's making me someone different. That's what happens. And so that's what's going to take place, I believe, in the tribulation. The tribulation saints will give the, the witness to who Jesus Christ actually is. And it says they overcame by the blood of the Lamb. We just celebrated what that means. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 tells us that without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin. That means no washing away, no forgiveness of sin. That will happen. And we will be able to stand as kingdom people... The kingdom of God is within you and be able to tell people that truth, even if it costs their lives. If we're not there, someone's going to be there. The saints of the tribulation will be there. And they will have the Holy Spirit, the power of the kingdom, overwhelming them so that they would not dare deny the living Christ. And they will talk of who he is, the blood of Jesus Christ, the sacrifice for sin that washes away all of our sin. That blood will also be made as the new covenant with God. Luke chapter 22, verse 20. Jesus said, this is the new covenant made in my blood. What's a new covenant? In the Old Testament, the old covenant was the law. And in the New Testament, the covenant is his blood. Now, what's the difference? You see, by the law, you were required to die. And what most people don't know, this is very interesting. You may have never thought of this. By the old law, people strove to live. And did you know that most of our world today is still trying to live under the old law? And they don't even know it. They know the Ten Commandments or something along that line and how to be good and what's moral and what isn't moral. They either obey or they don't obey. And you hear people saying, well, I think I'll, I, I hope I'll be good enough to get into the heaven. And I like to say, well, you won't be. That's always a shock to them, you know. But it's true. I say, you know, you're living under an old law. What do you mean I'm living under a law, an old law? I says, you're living under an old law that you have to be good enough to do this and to do that and to get to heaven. I said, don't you want to know what the new law is? Some say yes, some don't. I haven't had that happen in a while. But when they do, I'll tell them the new law is this. Everything is paid for. The blood of Jesus Christ has wiped out the penalty against you. It's been nailed to the cross and you are set free if you just enlist in the kingdom of God. Many people don't enlist in the kingdom of God not because they don't believe. They don't enlist in the kingdom of God because they don't want to make the change. They don't want to be changed. But that's what happens in the new covenant. So the new covenant is made. It's a new way of walking and relating to God. This new covenant cleanses your conscience. Isn't that amazing? How many of you have done a lot of things in your lifetime you wish you'd never done and you hope no one ever finds out about I have a list of those. There are deep, dark regrets in my life. But you know, I lived in fear of them for years, and now I don't fear them.
because I know Jesus Christ has died for those and he's cleared my conscience because you see somebody should have paid. I should have paid for what I've done. And Jesus said, you sure should have, but I did. And it's done. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that's what we see. And then he cleanses us from all sin. Not some sin, but all sin. The second thing, it says that they won not only by the blood, they overcame not only by the blood of the Lamb, but the word of their testimony. Now I want to give you some, some counsel about testimony. And I'm only going to go five over. So listen quick. The testimony. I hear a lot of testimony that's 45 minutes of trash. Well, I was this, and I did that, and I was a drug addict, and I was chasing women, and I slept with 50 men, and they go on and on and on and on and on. And you listen to this stuff, and you just feel slimed. And then they go, and I came to Jesus Christ, and everything's been great. And no one's heard anything about Jesus Christ. They've heard all the trash. They're talking trash. I don't do that. You guys know my testimony to a degree but I don't get up here and bawl and squall about what I was and what I did. I tell you, hey, I was a jerk. I broke every one of the Ten Commandments at some point in my lifetime, and God has saved me. Boom, and then I give you the next 40 years of what he's doing to me now. That's what people need to hear. They don't need to hear your trash. They need to hear the gospel. They need to know that Jesus Christ can change a life. They need to know that there is good news, but the first part is bad news. The bad news, you're a sinner. The good news is you can be saved. The bad news is you're on a track to hell. The good news is God can put you on a road to heaven. These are the things that we need to understand why revelation is so powerful and why the scripture is so powerful. It's not about you. This testimony is the testimony that they're going to stand up and declare the good news of Jesus Christ. Will they be afraid? Yes, they will. I've been afraid. And the Lord has always put words in my mouth, things I thought I could never do, I have done because the Holy Spirit was there, because the kingdom of God was within, bursting to get out. And not with all of how bad I was, and boy, brother, you know, you know, I've actually heard people talk about they didn't have a testimony. I've been to these meetings where people get up and talk about, you know, they were prostitutes, and they were this, and they were that, and they go on for 45 minutes, and you kind of just want to go take a shower. And then they finish, and I was Jesus Christ, I'm good. And that's the end of it. They don't explain anything. And I have heard, I can't tell you how many people come up to me in places like that, and I'm their pastor, and they say, Pastor, you know what? I don't have a testimony. I said, what are you talking about? You don't have a testimony. Well, I, I never did any of those things. God had not saved me from very much. I said, he had to save you from something. He had to save you from sin. He had to save you from yourself. You have a testimony. Your testimony is Jesus. Do you understand what I'm saying? Read Paul. Paul's testimony about himself is about that long. His testimony about Jesus is like that. This is the part that brings people to Christ. You know, you don't have to tell them all you're smut. They know about their own. The reality is you tell them what sin is, you define that, and you show them how to get to the one who can fix it, who can cleanse it, and make them whole in him. That's the testimony that I believe that in those days... They'll have very little time to say what they say. And when they're standing there looking at the guillotine or looking at the, the gun pointed at their head, they're going to say, well, give me 45 minutes to let me tell you about my, my past. They're going to say, let me tell you about Jesus Christ. That is our testimony. I can't stand testimonies of blah, blah, blah about self. Testify to me about Jesus Christ. Show me from the word who he is and what he has done in your life since you've known him. That's what will convince me. And I've seen it convince many others. And then it says they will not love their lives even unto death. The word life there is the Greek word suke, which is where we get the word psychology, where we get the word soul. And what it means, and I'll close very quickly now, it means that they will not care. They will not care for themselves anymore. They will put Jesus Christ above everything. They will be willing to die for their faith because they really know who they really know. The question for the church is, do you believe what you say you believe? Do you really know him that you say that you know? Do you really have that relationship with him? And is he first in your life? That's the only way you will ever put him above yourself, is that if he is first. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 37, if any man loves mother or father, 
son or daughter, or even his own life more than me, he is not worthy of me. And I want to explain something to you. Love is not necessarily emotional. It's not necessarily the ooey-gooey kind of a thing. Love is expressed to God in our commitment. He's not real worried if you cry when you worship or, or you jump up and down or raise your hands or clap your hands or tap your feet. That's not really what he wants. It's okay, but he's looking at where's your commitment? Have you joined the church? And I don't mean that for salvation, but have you joined a congregation? Have you joined yourself to Jesus Christ and begun to serve him from your heart with all of your energy? That's what Jesus is about. Jesus first. That's what it's about. So as I close, I ask you that question. Where are you in your relationship with Jesus Christ? Is he secondary? Maybe. Or is he way down the line of priority, maybe 10th or 12th? When I get all this done and all this done and all this done and all this done and I feel comfortable with all this, 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 and this, then I'll follow Jesus. That's not the way it works. Jesus said, follow me today. Take up your cross and follow me. And that is a privilege. I hear people whining about, oh, my cross, my cross. Don't whine about it. It is a privilege to bear the cross of Christ. It is a privilege to be a part of the kingdom of God. And it is a privilege to serve your commander. That's what Revelation is telling us. Jesus is coming. What are you doing? Jesus is getting closer. What are you doing? Jesus is at the door. What are you doing? Are you in relationship to him? And are you allowing him to be the sovereign and the king of your life? Father, I pray that you would take these messages and these words, sink them deep in the hearts of our people, help them each one to look at themselves and not me or any other person, not a spouse or a child, but ask themselves the simple question, Lord, am I a faithful servant? I've enlisted, now am I involved? Have I accepted the call of Christ, but not the commitment? May you move in the spirit today, Father, to draw commitment out of each and every one of us. Forgive us when we tell you no. Help us, Lord, that we would say yes. I ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Serve your king. Serve your king.